All right, so hello everybody. Uh, I hope you had lunch. Uh, this is a post lunch session. So here we'll be talking about uh, PII detection emails through Qlora fine tune LLMs. And uh, it doesn't mention here, but we have also benchmarked the same approach with the traditional ML approach as well. So this is sort of the agenda. Before we start, how many of you are working in the NLP field at the moment? Show of hands, all right, a lot, great. And how many of you are working on fine tuning LLMs, RLHF, all that, DPO, PPO kind of stuff, great, all right. You will find this interesting. So this is the sort of agenda. We'll start with the introduction, what we are doing, the data preparation stage, what approaches we took, the evaluation metrics, and then we'll have a discussion on the overall results. So to start with the introduction, uh, we'll start with what exactly is PI detection, and that is personally identifiable information. So um, basically, so much text analytics is going on. We have a lot of data in the form of app reviews. There's also um, you know, customer agents. They share the, a lot of private information, uh, email IDs. I, and in emails, it could be IP addresses, addresses in general, phone numbers, a lot of it. And when we use this, all this text data for text analytics, it's very important that um, you know, the model is not remembering this PII. Also, when we are sending all this data outside our environment, say to a different client or something like that, it is important that we mask these things appropriately. And anyone who has worked with these things know how tedious it is to manually mask all of the PII. And there are uh, pre-existing tools. We will be discussing those. But most importantly, uh, we'll be talking about how can we apply the LLMs. They're all the craze right now. And uh, it's important that we benchmark the newest techniques with whatever we had in the beginning and see how they're performing. Uh, most importantly, we'll also talk about some data set limitations. Um, if you're trying to mask PII, most probably you don't have any label data. Either you will be curating it yourself or something like that. So here we have also tried to simulate a limited data scenario where you don't have that much training data as we will be seeing in the future. And also uh, security concerns. So very important since it's PII data, your consumer data, you want to have something which is on premise. Um, we want to as much as possible avoid making API calls to an outside LLM, even though right now with GPT-4 and ChatGPT, it's like almost impossible, right? A lot of us are using those models, but still, that's a priority. And also, yeah, privacy-centric methods. So we start with the data set preparation. The limitations we already discussed, we have very limited amount of labeled data. We talk about the origin. So the data that we have used here, it's a real email data. It was uh, made public by FERC over in the investigation of a company called Enron. So we have the real emails of employees of this company. Um, a lot of, like as you see, as you know, the real world data, there's a lot of garbage, a lot of new line characters, spaces, and uh, just a mess. So we are as close to the real world data as possible. Um, if anyone wants to further explore or do experimentations, this is the link. You can find the entire data set there. Um, this is one of the sample inputs. This is just like a smaller one. So basically salutations, uh, whatever. This could have a lot of a lot more information. This is just a representative of the sample input. Next, we move on to the preparation. As I mentioned, uh, it's a limited data scenario. So we just use a limited amount of 2,000 something for training and 200 and 500 for validation and testing, trying to simulate a case where humans can label this much data. And these are the PII categories that we are going to be masking. Name, email, phone number, uh, IP address, login details, etc. Login details could have username, password, but it's one category. And yeah, so we have synthetic data generation. Um, we use GPT-4 for creating the synthetic data. And we will come to, like, that's not perfect because um, GPT-4 also hallucinates at times, right? But like, as per the literature, uh, GPT-4 comes around 80%, you know, in line with the human uh, alignment, hum human preferences. So it was a decent uh, way to prepare synthetic data. And we also tried doing it with chat GPT, GPT-3.5, but too many hallucinations. Um, Next, we come to the manual curation that we had to do. So as I mentioned, right, GPT-4, even though it did a decent job at um, detecting PII and masking it, we still had to filter out a lot of data, like uh, roughly 200, um, where it was detecting categories which you know uh, did not exist. Uh, so some random uh, categories that it could detect on its own. Um, and there were cases where it was not a PII category and it was still labeling it as a PII category despite all the prompt engineering. So all of that had to be taken care of to make sure the quality is good enough. 
All right. Now we come to the crux of it, which is the approaches. So the first approach is the baseline approach, and this is the the easiest one, right? You use ChatGPT, do some prompt engineering, do some temperature tuning, and you get the results. Uh, not much to see here. Next, we do the same thing with BERT, and we will touch more on how we did this. Uh, basically, we converted our emails into a token classification problem, but the overall crux is that we used BERT for PI detection. And this is the last one, which is what we are here for. We use the Vicuna 7 billion model and the Qlora fine tuning technique. And we'll discuss like why we chose the model, um, what's Qlora, uh, what was the training inferencing setup, what GPU we used, all of that will come to. All right, so, so yeah, we don't need introduction to ChatGPT. Uh, we know it's the most accessible model, so a very like an easy approach to baseline any NLP solution at the moment. You put it uh, through the pipeline, uh, the API call with prompt engineering, you get the results. And we did some uh, tuning here and there with the prompts and the temperature to get some, some amount of decent accuracy. That was the setup. And what we got at the end was some sort of baseline performance. So if you can get a model ready to do your task in one or two days, or like one day, uh, it's a good enough baseline that anything that I do after this to apply you know, um, traditional ML or uh, say I do fine tuning of LLMs, it should at least go above this, right? Because if I can do this in two days, then obviously the client will say like, well, why are you working more? You already got 70% accuracy. Okay, next we go to BERT for PI detection. The overall approach, the crux of it is that we transform the PI detection problem into a token classification task. What I mean by that is, say we have a mail like this, we uh, create a list of strings from this mail, and each, I, uh, each word inside the mail it is either a category of PII or it's just an outside label, which is not PII. And this is, uh, so we converted this entire PII detection into a token classification problem. And that is why we chose BERT for it. All right. So we use the BERT base in case model. And BERT has been here for a very long time. We already know it's very good at NER, very good at POS tagging. So it was a very strong candidate for us. All right. And these are the training details. Uh, we use the bird base encased. We use our CPU servers, so that is a great advantage at the moment. Um, no GPU required to do any sort of fine tuning or further processing here. And the same setup was used for inferencing as well. All right, next we come to the, the final approach, which is Vicuna 7 billion model, fine tuned with Qlora. Yeah, very hefty name. Um, two things we'll talk about here. One is why we chose this model, and one is the overarching technique that we are using here, which is your, which should be your takeaway from this talk. Like, even if you're not doing PI detection, you're doing just any NLP task, you should, your focus should be on instruct tuning LLMs. So when we are fine tuning, uh, basically we show these LLMs a particular prompt. We are still changing model weights. Um, we are still doing fine tuning, but we give it an instruction, perform the following task, we give it the X, we give it the Y, and that is called instruction tuning of LLMs. And this is a model agnostic approach. So right, uh, we know the LLM sphere is changing very quickly, right? So right now we have Vicuna 7B. Uh, this was done like a month ago. Uh, a week later, you could get Minstrel. A week later, you will get Zephyr. LLMs will keep coming up. So this is like a more of a model agnostic approach. You could replace it with a different model, tune the parameters, do all of the work after this, but the pipeline will more or less remain same. Next, we come to why did we choose this model? So here I talk about, uh, firstly, the introduction to the model. This is the Vicuna 7 billion model. It was fine-tuned on the Llama 2 7 billion model from, with, from data from sharegpt.com. And it was chosen on the basis of a LMSYS leaderboard. So this is another very good resource to use um, this leaderboard. It is right now curated on Hugging Face. Uh, this leaderboard is curated, curated by people at CMU and UCSD, and they very regularly benchmark all open source and proprietary models that exist in our LLM space. So it's a good place to look out for you know um, new models come up and you um, to pick them up. So these are the top five you see here. Minstrel is somewhere in the top five. We see Turbo and Gemini and everything. In the longer list, at the time of doing this experiment, Vicuna was one of the better 7 billion per parameter models, and that is why we chose that model. All right, next we come to the fine tuning technique that we used. So the over overall technique, like the, like the giant circle under which all the techniques are going to fall, that's called PEFT. So parameter efficient fine tuning technique. 
and these techniques are the techniques that we use to fine tune LLMs and uh, you know these are 7 billion model, this is a 7 billion parameter, ma parameter model, it could get bigger, it's very difficult to fine tune these on consumer GPUs, like you might have experienced this, you go out of memory issue on the GPUs very quickly and uh, if you use even a larger data set, that goes, that happens even faster. What PEFT techniques allow us is that um, it reduces the amount of resources required to fine tune these LLMs and we will see the two techniques that we use but um, there are many PEFT techniques, there are adapters and uh, yeah, the resource for you again to go is Hugging Face, great library, great place for uh, NLP, you know, R&D these days. If you just search Hugging Face PEFT, you will see all the PEFT techniques and also the codes and pipelines on do it, so explore further. Okay, the first technique that we used was LoRa technique. So these are very, uh, if you see, look at the, uh, yeah, so basically in fine tuning we'll be updating the weights, right? And uh, these weights are mostly in the 32-bit formatting. and uh, it's difficult, this whole computation of forward pass, backward pass, and this updating is very difficult. So what we do is, um, in this, the delta W, that the updation that we, is, we are going to do to the weight of the LLM, that is decomposed into two matrices, two lower ring matrices. And the original weight is more or less frozen through the entire pipeline. What this does is, um, it reduces the memory consumption to a very large extent, and uh, it makes it more accessible for us to do it on the GPUs. And an another flavor of uh, LoRa technique, which we use in this uh, experiment was QLoRa. So QLoRa is a even like, it builds on top of LoRa. Uh, we use, we are still using adapters, but we're using quantization here as well. So QLoRa, if you read the literature, it offers you quantization, dequantization and normalization. So what that does is, uh, the LLM weights are generally in 32-bit format, but at the time of training, uh, and these adapters are also in the 32-bit format. So at the time of training, we freeze the weights of the main LLM in 4-bit and during the fo forward pass and backward pass, we quantize and dequantize and update it in real time. And that what that does is it reduces the memory footprint drastically. So your, uh, your training pipelines don't show uh, out of memory er issue and also the inferencing time in the training time is also reduced drastically. Here we have used the 4-bit precision, but you could also go for 8-bit, but as per the literature, 4-bit is a decent place for, um, what do you call it, the downstream task. Whenever you're fine-tuning LLM for downstream task, 4-bit precision does good work. And for inferencing as well, you can use 4-bit precision. For QLoRa, you can use bits and bytes libraries. Uh, it's all available on the internet. Um, okay. We use Hugging Face Trainers library for this, and uh, a lot of tuning had to be done in the sense that there were a lot of uh, parameters like uh, gradient accumulation, learning rate, and uh, most importantly, the batch sizes for training and evaluation. So you have to be careful about these uh, few things to make sure you're, again, you're not running out of memory uh, errors during a training session. And this is the training setup that we used. We used the Vicuna 7 billion model. And you have to remember uh, that this is the the later version, which is commercially available. So you have to be careful, right? Like when you're using these LLMs of fine tuning, they might be open domain, but they're not available for commercial usage. So keep checking when you're doing these experiments. And we use the MLG5 2x large instance on AWS. Um, here it has around, I think, 24 GB of VRAM, and it's a 810 GPU. So again, be careful when you're doing these experiments. We earlier did these experiments on older GPUs. Older GPUs will take much more uh, training time and will cost you much more money. All right, so next we come to the fine tuning details. Uh, we mostly use, ta uh, use the rank of the, of the delta W that you update to the weights as a parameter. And we kept alpha as 16 like constant. This was mostly done um, like that's what the literature recommends and you can also look at it that the alpha upon r, that's the, the factor by which the weights are updated. So to, we only kept r as the one of the variables for fine tuning and we use the learning rate as the other one. If you use learning rate, alpha and r together, that just compounds the effect of your fine tuning and you don't want that to happen as well because you want the model to retain the earlier fine tuning, like earlier learning that it had. And overall, this was the uh, graph or the output from the rank uh, when we did the experiments. Overall, around 64, we saw that we were getting good results. This is on the validation data set. 
Next, we come to the evaluation metrics that we used for this. Uh, one of the most uh, important uh, metric that we use is perplexity. So any fine tuning experiment that you do, uh, keep logging the perplexity because that is overall a metric about how well your model is at, uh, how good your model is at to uh, in predicting the next token. It's in general the confidence. So monitoring perplexity is a good way to see whether your model is learning uh, adequately or not. And the final perplexity of the training was 1.42. And the metrics in general was, uh, since you, like you, we already discussed this, that here we converted this problem of PII detection into token classification. So classical uh, evaluation uh, metric, which is, which is precision recall and F1 score, we use those uh, to gauge how well the outputs was. And we noticed that there was a weak correlation in QLORA rank and the model metrics, so we went for the rank 64. So these are the graphs. Uh, that's the train and, and validation loss and perplexity. Uh, there was no spike in, uh, in the training process, so which was good, and perplexity was also steadily declining. All right, next we move on to the observations. So this, was, this is the most important topic uh, when it comes to fine-tuning LLMs in general. If you have fine-tuned LLMs, you will see that in mo most downstream tasks, it hallucinates drastically. So ha evaluating hallucinations was a very important part. Um, when we used GPT 3.5, it hallucinated a lot. Same goes for Vicuna. Uh, we, did, we evaluated these hallucinations two ways. One was we programmatically had put some checks that if you are detecting categories which are not part of my PII, that's a hallucination. If you're producing a sentence which is not exactly what I gave as an input, that's again hallucination. And uh, so this is how we detected. And the, all the results that you will see after this, they are after uh, taking out the um, all the results which were hallucinating. And BERT, as we know, is a mass language model. That's the best point, uh, you know, positive point for BERT. It does not hallucinate. Uh, it may give wrong outputs, but does not hallucinate. So very reliable. And uh, these are the overall results for hallucinations. Um, Vikuna still did hallucinate considerably less not considerably, but slightly less than GPT 3.5. GPT, GPT 3.5 was the highest in terms of hallucination. And uh, next, we move on to the performance matrix and the final scores. So BERT did overall the best um, results. So I would say we do not, do not, do not look at accuracy here because uh, we have a lot of out categories as well, right? Which are uh, just that it is not a PII and we don't want to focus on that. We want to mainly focus on the F1 score. And if you see here, like GPT 3.5 did not, not a great job, BERT did quite well and uh, uh, the top and Vicuna 7B still quite did quite better. And uh, so basically your open source fine tuned LLM uh, did quite better than the GPT 3.5. So that's a great insight. All right. Uh, coming to the conclusion of what we discussed. Um, so why should you be fine tuning your open source LLMs when you have GPT 3.5, GPT 4 in the API calls, right? The biggest point is like you have very little control over these models apart from the API calls. Um, they could be, uh, there could be changes in the model weights, updation from the back end. Uh, there are other issues as well with proprietary LLMs. Or maybe you are in a cloud environment where you don't have access to the best models from OpenAI. Like let's say in AWS, where you only have access to Jurassic or uh, say Claude is here now, but still. Um, so what do you do in such cases? And also um, data security. We are not making any API calls. You are the one hosting this model as per your requirement in your own uh, uh, cloud environment. And uh, overcoming the li limitations of proprietary models, we all have must have faced this, the rate limit quotas, which happens for LLMs very often, that you throttle it too much, it starts giving, uh, you have run out of quota. How do you handle that? And also, uh, this also makes sure that it's um, very optimal for you, in the sense that you can scale up and scale down the model's uh, resources as per your requirements. If it, is, if it is not being used, you bring it down. If the throughput is too much, you scale the instance running the model up. And according to that, uh, you know, that's the advantage. Future work. Um, most importantly, new models are coming every day. So keep, we should be keep uh, doing these experiments further with the better models. Now we have a minstrel 7B mixture of experts models, right? So keep doing these experiments. And also uh, maybe uh, manually prepared data sets could do better in the sense that GPT-4 uh, still is only 80% inline, right? That could still include hallucinations or incorrectly labeled data. So manually curating your data set would also be a great choice for improving these results. Yeah, 
that's it any questions